This headset is interesting, not because it's the next big thing, but because it's trying a lot of things at once and some of them are actually working. Even after reviewing headsets for over 8 years, that genuinely caught my attention. This is the Play for Dream MR, a standalone headset with 8K micro OLED screens, eye tracking and a massive camera and sensor array all running on Android. It costs around 2000 US dollars, which puts it right between the big screen Beyond 2 and the Apple Vision Pro. But unlike those, it can wirelessly stream PC VR, play Quest games, and it's the first Android spatial computer to actually ship. Even if you're not into VR, this is part of a new wave of standalone devices that are pushing the limits and hitting some walls along the way. I've been testing it for a few days and it surprised me. Some choices are clever, others few unfinished. I definitely underestimated this device, so I still need more time for a full review but my first impressions are strong enough to share so join me beyond reality let's start with the unboxing which is pretty premium it's a sleek black box the headset itself comes with a nice cover and if you take it off you'd notice it looks a lot like something between the quest pro and the apple vision pro it's impressively thin only 33 millimeters but there's no top strap so comfort could go either way and i'll come back to that later the controllers are rechargeable lightweight and a bit plasticky but they sit nicely in the hands but what's strange is the lack of lanyards. I'm just so used to them that now I feel like I'm wall docking VR. On top of that, they rely on optical tracking, so the headset's cameras need to see the IR markers. Since most of the surface is covered by your hands, I am curious how this will hold up in games. There's also a second thinner face casket that lets you sit closer to the lenses, plus the usual extras, cloth manuals and a cable clip that's nothing fancy but useful. The charging setup is thoughtful. You get one adapter with both USB-A and USB-C, a split cable that charges both controllers at once and a dedicated USB-C to USB-C cable for the headset. It's kind of thoughtful because that means you don't have to hunt for extra chargers. So far it feels like a clean well-organized package but the real test is what happens once you power it on. But before that I've got to show you what's been supporting all of this work literally. This part sponsor. I upgraded to the FlexiSpot E7 Pro standing desk and it's already changing how I work. Most desks I've used in the past were either wobbly, not ergonomic or just not built for long hours. The E7 Pro is the opposite, rock solid with a 440 pound weight capacity and a dual motor lift system that glides from sitting to standing. I can even adjust it anywhere between 25 and 50.6 inches which is perfect since I'm always switching between headset testing, filming and editing. And here's the part I love the most, even when I'm typing or moving the desk up and down, it doesn't shake. I've balanced my Myself, coins, a glass of water, and yes, even a stack of headsets on it just to test stability, and it didn't budge. That's when I realized how thoughtfully built it is. Even during setup, I noticed the little details, and it honestly came at the perfect time since I'm redoing my studio colors. I think it just looks beautiful here. So, if you want to upgrade your own setup, check out FlexiSpot using the link below, and don't forget to use my $30 discount code on your own E7 Pro. And now, let's continue with the quick setup. Once powered on, you pick your language with the dial on the top right and press it to confirm. The headset has eye tracking, so it can use that to move the lenses automatically to match the distance between your eyes. Having it adjust for you still feels like a high-tech feature and it's smooth and accurate. That same dial on the top right also doubles as a handy control. Hold it down and it re-centers the view. Tap it to open the menu. You can even use it to toggle between pass-through and the VR environment. If that sounds familiar, that's because it works almost exactly like the Apple Vision Pro. There's even an eye tracking and hand tracking calibration that looks almost identical down to the animation style. So yeah, it shares a lot of similarities with the Apple Vision Pro, except this one is built on Android. In fact, it's the first Android spatial computer to actually ship, beating Samsung's upcoming headset that will use Android XR. Just to be clear though, this isn't Android XR. The Play for Dream MR runs on its own custom system built on top of Android. But here's the interesting part. 
part. It's much more open than what Meta allows. You can easily sideload apps, even use the Aurora store, which is like an open source Google Play store. That means apps you're probably already using like YouTube, Discord, streaming apps, or even custom tools are just a download away. With some caveats, which I'll talk about in a bit. It's a setup that feels familiar, but also surprisingly flexible. And that openness sets the stage for some really interesting use cases. And if you like seeing headsets break the rules a little, maybe break that like button too. <laughs> it helps more than you think. Now the displays are the first thing that really stand out. The Play for Dream MR uses pancake lenses and Duo 8K micro OLED panels, technically 3840 by 3552 per eye. So yeah, the 8K label is mostly marketing, but what matters is that they look really sharp. Text is readable and thanks to the angled panel placement, the field of view feels wide. It's marketed at 103 degrees field of view with 45 pixels per degree. When I measured it with WIM Evo V, I got about 91 degrees vertically and 100 degrees horizontally and that's pretty much in line with other modern headsets. So this was with the default head strap and the thin face cover included in the box. For the full review, I'll test it again with some comfort mods to see if the FOV can be pushed even further. But here's where it gets even more interesting. This headset actually gives you multiple rendering modes to choose from. By default, it boots into 4K eye-tracked voviated rendering at 72 or 90 Hz. On paper, that sounds efficient, but in practice, there's a lot of chromatic aberration, especially at the edges. So special shout out to Valve for the tips. He showed me that switching to full 4K rendering and enabling chromatic aberration correction makes the image look beautiful, clear, sharp, and much closer to what these panels are capable of. The only downside is in this mode, you're capped at 72 Hz, though an 80 Hz option is being tested. Not working yet though. The catch is the hardware. The Snapdragon XR2 Plus Gen 2 chip inside isn't powerful enough to run both foveated rendering and chromatic aberration correction at the same time, so most people end up using the full rendering modes instead. 4K at 72 Hz for the sharpest picture, or 3K at 90 Hz if you prefer smoother motion in games. The pro is you can switch modes depending on the situation. Eye tracking in games is fixed now, it wasn't before, but you can now even even use quad view dynamic foveated rendering in supported titles. In theory, that's great when the headset or your PC is struggling with a heavy game, but not a lot of games support it yet. So I need, still need to find the right title to put it through its paces. So if you have recommendations, let me know in the comments. So it's not as plug and play as you would hope, but once you find the right settings, the payoff is worth it. The games and apps I tried so far look stunning on these panels, especially darker scenes where the OLED really shines. More on this in a bit. The pass-through looks solid. During the day, it's high quality, though still a little grainy and the exposure struggles at times. At night, it becomes much grainier, but that's true for all headsets right now. I would say it's on par with or slightly better than Quest 3, but I'll put it through its paces more later on. More importantly, it feels stable, so you can walk around or even work in it comfortably. Talking about work, what surprised me most is how a standalone headset can push this this kind of resolution. With virtual desktop, I can spawn three monitors at 1440p each, just like on the Quest 3, but it is noticeably sharper. Most other standalone headsets don't have the display quality to pull that off. There is one catch though, like most micro OLED displays, it suffers from glare. If you're typing on a white background or working with high contrast apps, you will notice reflections and halos around bright text. It's distracting at times, but much easier to manage in dark mode. So if you're a coder, you're, you're good. <laughs> the big difference is that Apple Vision Pro runs in a fully integrated ecosystem where every Apple product works together so well. Play for Dream doesn't have the kind of support for other devices, so it's missing some of the interaction design touches that makes the Vision Pro so fluid. The OS can likely improve, but right now it just isn't as seasoned. I can download 
most Android apps using the Aurora Store, but it's a hit or miss. Like Discord and Netflix work fine, but Google apps like YouTube or Gmail don't run properly until you go through some tricking. That's probably to be expected on a new OS and you can always work around it by just streaming your laptop or PC instead. So while it's usable for productivity, depending on your use case, and sharper than I expected for a standalone, it's not the same polished experience you would get on AVP. Then again, this headset is over $1,500 cheaper and the fact it can already do what it does now is pretty incredible. For gaming, glare isn't really a problem. Once you're in darker environments or colorful worlds, the OLED panels shine, literally. I tried a few ports from the Quest like Hubris and the higher resolution made them look stunning. Small details that usually get lost suddenly stand out. And this was one of those moments where I had to remind myself this was running on a wireless standalone headset. Streaming PC VR to virtual desktop was just as impressive. The developer actually worked directly with Play for Dream and it shows. Latency stays low even at this resolution. Darker games especially look incredible thanks to the deep blacks, rich colors and the crisp details that make everything just more immersive. You can also use the Play for Dream PC VR streaming app but honestly it's just not as good as VD and in my opinion it is totally worth the money. But yes, streaming has compression and more latency compared to a tethered headset like the Beyond 2 but here it looks surprisingly close and noticeably better than Quest 3 with the same setup. Depending on what you game, the wireless at this quality is just so nice. That really caught me off guard. It's also interesting that Play for Dream already has a passionate community around it. Quest games can apparently be ported and over 40 have already been tested and confirmed working. That's not something I expected to see at all. For watching movies, the panels are fantastic, but the glare is more noticeable, especially if you like watching with subtitles. And by default, apps like YouTube only render at 1080p, which is a shame because the PFD can handle higher so the community of course found a workaround to force 4k it takes a bit of tweaking again but once you've got it my gosh that looks stunning honestly that should be the default so uh, this tip also came from valve and seriously pfd i think you should pay him one more nice thing here is the storage the headset comes with 512 gigs so you can keep a lot of local media on the device itself great if you want to watch high quality videos without relying on streaming one con is I haven't been able to get DRM apps like Netflix to run in 4K yet, but that might just be due to external factors since the headset supports it, but it's worth keeping in mind. Now the headset is impressively thin at 33 millimeters and the rear battery helps keep it balanced. It weighs 650 grams in total and at first it feels light and sits comfortably, but after about a half hour I noticed some forehead pressure. The missing top strap keeps the design sleek, but it probably seems more weight onto the forehead and cheeks. So for now, comfort feels decent for short sessions, but I will need more time and maybe some accessories to see how it holds up long term. Now, if I had to pick the biggest downside so far, it would be battery life. The headset has a built-in 5060 mAh pack, which only gives about an hour of standalone use. That's pretty short, though not surprising with two micro OLED panels and an overclock chip pulling extra power. So yeah, most people in the community solve this with a power bank, so I tried that too. A 20,000 mAh pack, stretched playtime to around 4 hours, depending on what you're doing. You will need one that outputs at least 30 watts, otherwise the headset won't charge while in use. I've been using one that works well, I'll link it below, but it's bulky and uh, leaves cables dangling, so I'd like to find a cleaner solution. For now, battery life feels like the biggest compromise and it's fine for short sessions, but if you want to game longer or work longer, an external battery isn't just a nice to have, it's basically required. Controller tracking is handled with inside out optical tracking, so the headset cameras watch the IR markers on the controllers and so far it's been solid. There are some uh, dead spots here and there but nothing that really got in the way during my testing. For most games it feels accurate enough which is actually one of the things that surprised me the most they did good work on this one. Hand tracking works well too so far and people tell me it's one of the better ones but I will need more
more time to really put them through their paces, see if there's any use cases for it for the full review. Audio, on the other hand, didn't impress me at first out of the box. It just sounds a little boxy and flat. You can improve it with an equalizer app from the Aurora store, but even then it could still be better. To be fair though, VR headset speakers have never exactly been Beats by Dre, so if you really want immersion, you're probably going to use your own headphones anyway. So far, the Play for Dream MR feels like a really interesting headset. The displays are gorgeous once you tweak the settings, virtual desktop runs amazingly well, and even the controller tracking surprised me in a good way. On top of that, you can play standalone quest games and there's a chance more will come in the future. It's not perfect though, comfort might need mods, audio could be better, battery life is by far the biggest compromise and overall it takes more tweaking than most might like and at this price you probably won't get enough out of it if you don't already own a VR ready PC. What did surprise me is that it isn't just smoke and mirrors, yes it leans on marketing terms and borrows a lot from the Vision Pro but it already feels feels like a serious attempt. Further along than I expected for a first Android based spatial computer. It's open, flexible and has a passionate community behind it which makes me curious to see how quickly it will evolve from here. So these are my first impressions as I really underestimated this review. There's just so much to this headset so give me some time to see how it holds up in daily use but for now it's safe to say this headset is doing a lot of things well and I didn't think that I'd be saying that. But something to keep in mind, refunds are only given for hardware issues, not just for changing your mind. Which I do wonder if that's even allowed, but just so you know, you will want to be very, very sure before picking one up. I've added the link below if you want to check it out, but I would love to hear from you. What would you like me to test before the view review? Drop it in the comments. And if you found this video helpful, consider subscribing so you don't miss the follow up.